Hey, what's up, everybody? And welcome to Season 2 of History and a Drink with Sean and... I'm Frank. And today what we're going to be looking at is, as we discussed in our preview for the season, is everything's going to be about Florida. And one of uh, both of our favorite authors writes about Florida in all of his books. His name is Tim Dorsey. And so we're going to start in one of our favorite places that he's talked about a ton of times, which is Key West. Ah, uh, Key West, the end of the world. Exactly. Yeah. And Key West is just a, a fun place if you've never been there. Um, you should take the opportunity and go. We've gone there a bunch of times, both with, with kids and without kids, and all the time it's a fun time. Yeah. So, But as we're looking at it, the drink that we're going to do tonight deals with one of the big things that the Keys have always been known for, which is smuggling. Yeah. And so in, during Prohibition, those smugglers were known as... Rum runners. Exactly. Now, now, why were they known as rum runners? That was the big question. Exactly, because they were bringing rum in from Cuba yep. and Puerto Rico and the Bahamas and all of that kind and of place. Central, and Central and South America, I think, all the way across. Yeah. So. Because each of the areas has their own rum that they make, and so they were bringing that stuff in here. So we're going to make rum runners today. So the type of rum we're going to use is uh, Florida Cana. Which is a Nicaraguan rum, uh, absolutely fantastic stuff. Once again, we talk about Florida authors. And besides Tim Dorsey, another one of my favorite Florida authors is Randy Wayne White. Um, he actually writes a lot out of Sanibel and Captiva yep. Islands, and he has a character who's he writes a little bit more kind of kind of mystery novels, um, and he's got this character named Doc Ford, and Doc Ford's favorite rum is Florida kind of rum, which is a Nicaraguan, and they make a four-year, a 12-year, we got the four-year tonight, but uh, yep. good stuff. And so it calls for two types of rum, uh, the white rum, so we're gonna do a double up, since we're making two drinks for us, two shots of white rum. Delicious. And then we're gonna do two shots of dark rum. Which is their gold rum, which is probably their standard, I would say. delicious stuff. Now then, when I was doing the research for this, mm -hmm. one of the things that I found is that it was created in Almorada. And the, the drink, the rum runner the drink. The rum runner drink in the 1950s. And it yeah. seemed like a lot of the fruity drinks were made during that period of time. But it was really funny because it was made of basically the leftovers of the stuff that was in the bar that night. So it's kind night. of the, the end of the night, this is what we're putting together. Kind exactly. Of the, the, from the day before. So. so it had two shots of rum, it has a shot of orange juice, a shot of pineapple juice. Perfect fruity compliment. Exactly. And then it has two other ones, a raspberry liqueur, which I have here, and a banana liqueur. Excellent. I couldn't find any of those in anything but the cheap stuff. So it shows you a little bit of what that drink is. I would think that they would probably would be the cheap stuff. At the end of the night, you know, I've got a little bit in the bottles, and that's normally they're just made as a flavor, so. Exactly. The recipe that uh, I looked at calls for a full shot of it, but we both tried this, and a full shot of this raspberry and a full shot sweet. of the banana is way too sweet for us. So, because we're kind of sour and grumpy. Yeah. So, <laughs> half a shot, uh, or a full shot of each, because we're doing a double up. And then a full shot of the banana. <laughs> I think anyone who's got college days has some bad experiences with banana yeah, liqueur. Any, so. any of these flavored liqueurs. Ooh. All right. And then I had a straw around here to mix it up. but Absolutely. I got one right on over right. here. We got a straw to go. And then we're just going to pour it in a cup with ice. Excellent. I've got, I've got some ready to go. All right. So when I was looking at the history of Key West, um, Key West comes into possession of the United States in 1921, mm -hmm. or sorry, 1821. And this was really important because Key West has a long history before that, but it's not called Key West before that. No, not at all. It goes by a Spanish name. And what I found most fascinating is that it was actually owned by a Spaniard named, oh, what was his name? Uh, Juan... Uh, Soleus, and he actually sold Key West twice. Oh. 
Excellent. Once he sold it for a schooner to a guy from um, South Carolina. Okay. And then he also sold it in a bar in Cuba to a businessman who had a lot of um, businesses in uh, Alabama and Mississippi. And he sold it to him for what would be the equivalent of 2,000 pesos back then. I have no clue what that is in modern money, but it doesn't sound like a lot. Now, Key West at the time, was it known as Key West? Was it Had it, had it come by this name yet? No, it was known as Cayo... Cayo Huesa. Thank you. Quiet, which is actually Island of the Bones. Because at the time, this was for the Indians that were the original settlers of this thing. This was actually kind of a graveyard island. It was at the end of the... Yep. Of, of the island chains and stuff, and so it became known as Island Graveyard. So Cayo Huesa was, you know, like I said, this was a graveyard, but then when we came and the, the English came, Cayo Huesa became Kea Key West. Exactly. So that's where the name basically came from. And it is the farthest um, south that we have uh, a city on in the Keys. Um, okay. Now you can go well, in farther the, in the continental U.S. Yeah, it's the most southernmost city in the uh, continental U.S. You can go farther out, and you can go to Hawaii, uh, the Dry Tortugas. Uh, yep. Okay. It, and there is Fort Jefferson there, and it's a national park today, but it, it's not permanently settled. So Key West is the farthest that you can go where it's permanently yeah. settled in the Keys. Um, and the what was so fascinating for me as well about learning about the Keys is. When it got set up, it initially was set up to be a port for anti-piracy. And the first um, squadron that was uh, stationed there was an anti-piracy squadron, and it had five ships in it, and they were um, very shallow schooners. They could go mm -hmm. in um, the shallow areas and stuff like that, and they had some really awesome names. The, they were known as Mosquito, Sandfly, Nat, Midge, and then my favorite, which is Galley Nipper, nah. which is just a big uh, mosquito, I guess. Oh, man, the Galley Nipper. And this became known as the Mosquito Fleet. Ah. And they would then hunt down the pirates that were going and uh, attacking the Spanish ships, American ships um, throughout the early Lit 1920s. Literally the 1820s. pirates of the Caribbean. Well, eh, I think a little bit earlier, still, but the Florida Straits, but yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, so, th with that, we see that it becomes the largest city in Florida up until around 1900. Wow, even more so than Miami, even Mi more so than that. yeah, Miami didn't exist till like the late 1880s. I mean, there was there was the Miami, there was the Tampa, there was Jacksonville, but still, they were not you know Jacksonville and St. Augustine, but they still weren't major. Ports. Exactly. And one of the things that made Key West so successful early on was it had salt mines. Oh. Did you know that? No, I did not. And know up that. through the Civil War, that is one of the big areas or the big um, businesses that was run in the Keys was making salt. Ah. And it got shut down during the Civil War because the Key West always stays as part of the Union during the Civil War. The Confederates never take it. Really? Okay. And it's used as a big part of the Anaconda Plan, which was the uh, plan that the Northerners used to um, kind of suffocate yep. the um, Confederacy uh, by closing so, off the so sea. Even, so even though it was the southernmost point, it was actually never, never a southern exactly. port. Exactly. Uh, and southern when, you, base. when you look at who settles there, it's mostly New Englanders ah. because that's where the, the sailing community in mm -hmm. the United States really came from was from New England. And when you go down there today, if you look at a lot of the construction, they are basically um, northern t like houses that yep. were built there, deconstructed, brought down to the Keys, mm -hmm. and reconstructed there. And you see lots of, from a construction standpoint, you see lots of that trim, that gingerboard trim. Mm -hmm. And also, too, uh, one of the famous New England things are those widow walks, which are basically yep. where the wives and the daughters and the, the fiancés would walk to, to look for their husbands who are out sailing or patrolling the waters or doing things. And if you go down there today, you can see yep. 
tons of that architecture down there. It's really fascinating to go back off of Duval and off of uh, Truman and in the back roads there and kind of see the really cool houses that are there. Like Hemingway's house or yep. like the little white house. But then there's all kinds of other little ones. And what's really cool is a lot of them have become like bed and breakfasts. Yep. And um, places you can stay or, or little restaurants and stuff that you can go to and really see what the architecture was like back then. And quite a few have become bars. Yeah, so, exactly. And so probably the most famous bar in Key West is Sloppy Joe's. Yes. And um, so those of you who are wanting to come and have uh, an experience with us in the studio, that was our meal for tonight is we had Sloppy Joe's just like the recipe that I found from Sloppy Joe's down in um, Key West. And if you go down there, one of the best things to do is to go, I, I like to go in during the middle of the day and just to hear the live musicians that are playing exactly and that's a wonderful thing about them is that they're playing i mean really almost 24 hours a day <laughs> yeah exactly so. and so and then you can get there's food there there's yep. tons of drinks and actually the rum runner is their drink of choice as well yeah um, they have tons of other ones but the rum runner is their um signature drink at sloppy joe's so um, when i was also researching this one of the things that i found really fascinating too was Key West was, in the 1830s, was the richest city per capita in yeah. the United States and, and in the 1880s. And while a lot of their money came from these fishing fleets and the other things, what actually what a lot of them came from was from salvage. Yeah. And so there was this great reef that sat off of Key West. And one of the things, once again, we talk about the, the, you know, the houses that had these widow walks, also, too, there would be the the men of the house would stand there with spyglasses and they would watch that mm -hmm. reef. And every when it would happen was a ship hit those reefs and ran aground and basically then broke apart. It was a race because whoever got to that ship first and okay. was able to salvage off of it, they were able to get all those materials off of that basically at, for free for them. So they would basically wait for misfortune from these other ships to hit that and do that and then it was this mad race to get on out there so a lot of those fortunes came from them basically kind of taking stuff from yep. the ships that have crashed well and the florida straits is a big place where we see lots of ships going through into the atlantic into the yep. caribbean and into the gulf of mexico for shipping so uh, and then if you watch the news at all you see that the keys are always seem to have a couple hurricanes a year yeah. that go through them and that would add to it and, and actually when i was looking at the rum runner days um there was a famous ship called the um Sephora, mm -hmm. and it was it was actually made out of concrete it was yeah. a flat bottom ship and it ran booze from bimini in the bahamas okay. to the keys and um, they would go and sit at the three mile line, which became known as the Brum line, because that was the international boundary. And he would bring his ship there and then unload onto a lot of smaller ships. And they would take off when they could and, and, get, and basically get away from Exactly, from and the, so the, the- The man. Yeah, the Navy would have to, or the Coast Guard or whatever would have to try and catch all these little ships yeah. instead of one big one. But um, in 1926, there was a big hurricane that came through and it sank um, a little bit off of Bimini, and a lot of divers still go there today, and you can go and shipwreck uh, off of Bimini and see this ship. Uh, but there's tons of other places in the Keys that you can go diving for shipwrecks and all that <laughs> kind of stuff as well. And th there's a whole trail that you can go in and learn about if you go down there. Um, um, what's, the, what's the museum that's down there for the, the guy who found the Atosha? Yes, there's the Atosha that was down there, yeah. And through the Straits is also where some of the gold and silver ships that the Spanish had during the um, f late 1500s and 1600s, um, and some of them sank due to hurricanes and stuff like that there. And so there's all kinds of, of piracy and uh, sunken treasure and stuff like that. But one of the fascinating uh, pirates that I found was a man named Black Caesar. Have you ever heard of him? I have not, no. So he was a slave, or he was an African who they tricked into getting on board a ship, and they enslaved him. But from, from Africa. From Africa. From Africa, okay. Um, and on the voyage over, there was a storm. Okay. And the ship 
eventually broke up in the storm and he had befriended one sailor and the sailor had befriended him and, and supposedly they're the only two survivors of this ship oh, wow and so they landed in the keys like the middle keys um i think it was called hold on here let me see um Elliot Key and Old Rhodes Key. I don't know where they are off the top of my head, but that is where they took their rowboat and they used it to lure ships that were passing in, like they were shipwrecked. Like they were shipwrecked to come, hey, come help us. Come exactly. give us a hand. Yeah. And they would then capture Bam. what was out of the <laughs> ship and take what they wanted. Um, uh. And so they eventually, they hung out there for a while and um, eventually, as with almost it seems all good partnerships, there's a woman who comes in between the middle of them, and he, uh, Black Caesar, kills the white um, pirate. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and takes the woman for himself. But he goes on to become one of the lieutenants of Blackbeard. Ah, okay. So I think when we think of the, the pirates of the sure, Caribbean. Yeah. In the first movie, that African American pirate, who's like the first, the so he's taken from the character from the real life character of Black Caesar. Yeah, so I, awesome. I found that quite interesting yeah. as I was looking for. And he's kind of the most famous of the pirates who use the keys as their home base. So, um, the, to me, when you go down to the keys, that's one of the things that you need to stop along the way and see is some of the shipwrecks that are along the yeah. way. There's, you can see how smuggling in there became so easy. And it got to the point where in the late 70s and early 80s that they were bringing in so much marijuana and cocaine. Yeah, there, there, I say there was a different kind of smuggling. Right. No more, you know, alcohol and, and gold and, and jewels. It was then switched to illicit drugs and everything else. Exactly. And so. that's my favorite story of the Keys is in 1982... <laughs> The um, ATF and DEA shut down the keys, basically. They put a roadblock on US-1, which is the yep. only way in and out of the keys. It, it, there's a two-lane road, basically, all of the keys. Yep. That, that's, your, you, that's your only way in and out. Exactly. And they put a roadblock there, and they searched every car going in and out and every vehicle for drugs. Mm -hmm. And the mayor of Key West got so fed up with this because this was killing tourism. Oh, yeah. Because who's going to go down there when they know their car is going to get searched right. and all that kind of stuff? And so what he decided to do was he declared independence from the United States. And their own republic. Exactly. The Conk Republic. Um, so if you're born in Key West, you are known as a Conk. Right? And so they created the Conk Republic. And they then surrendered. Uh, right away to the and, and let me just help so, some of our some of our Yankee listeners. So conch, as in the shell with the the snail animal that you get from the ocean. C O N C H is not a conch; <laughs> it is a conch. Exactly. So just so it would just save you some some embarrassment. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. they declared their independence. They and I believe they threw some bread at the DEA agents as their protest and yeah. as their um, way of fighting them and then they surrendered and asked for I, I want to say it was either I can't remember how many zeros but it was either like a hundred million or a billion dollars uh, in foreign aid insane, yeah. because they were a foreign country and they were their own country exactly. <laughs> yeah. so but what's awesome about it today is that myth still uh, or that idea still is there is there is a conch republic um uh, embassy in Key West. And they have their own flag. They have their own, I mean, yeah. they, they, they... Where you can are, go for a hundred bucks, you can get your own passport. And I think it's for $10,000, you can get a diplomatic passport. Yeah. And if you go to the website, it is hilarious because there's stories on there of people who were like hiking in Honduras or maybe it was Nicaragua and they were picked up by like the Sandinistas or whatever and they didn't show their American passport they showed their conch passport and said that they were fighting the man in America <laughs> and they let him go yep <laughs> so That's it. as we as we look at Key West it is a ton of fun and if you yeah. haven't got the opportunity to go there it should be on your bucket list to go and see and and Frank and I have actually been there on two different occasions been there with the family and actually we took our wives and we stopped through on a cruise mm -hmm. um, I also took my wife and one of the best things I've ever did that I totally want to do again is they also do a nighttime ghost tour mm -hmm. where they go through 
Key West is also one of the most haunted uh, islands, basically. And one of the things that they, they tout is that I don't know if you knew this or not, but uh, according to, to folklore, ghosts and spirits can't cross water. So that was one of the Stop things there. why they'll do. They, they can't cross exactly uh, a river or a lake or bodies of water. They're not good. So when you die in an island, you're screwed. You're stuck there, and there's a lot of people that died on Key West. So um, it's absolutely uh, it's a it's a very um, for those who believe a very haunted place. And there's some great, funny, neat historical stories of mm-hmm. living and dying on Key West. And they got a really cool cemetery oh, to yeah, go to totally. because. Just like in, well, in New Orleans, they have them above ground, just like yeah. in Key West, but they do it because they're below sea level. Here, you can't dig down into it because it's a coral you, you atoll. Th- yeah, and, and, and not only that, but you dig down three feet and you hit water. So yeah. basically, everybody is in these rates. But one of the running, I don't know if, if gags or funny things is everyone tries, tries to outdo each other with their tombstones. So yeah. the, the funny comic tombstones. I told you I was sick. That was one of my favorite ones. Yeah. Not a Key West. So that, uh, you'll see a lot of those. So this is, uh, we're coming to the end of our first yep. episode here. And um, we're going to continue with the idea of the keys in next week's episode. And we're going to look at a man named Flagler. And he's a uh, very One of the Henrys. Yeah. One of the Henrys. Yeah. yeah. And he is going to be really instrumental in finding a way to get us to Key West where you don't have to just go by ship. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk about that next week. And if you would like to be uh, with us in the studio audience, um, we still have slots available if yeah. you want to come and down. Or if you just want to come for one episode or whatever, um, send us Give a us message a in that. Now, I have set up, we will have a Twitter account and an Instagram account. Um, and they are both uh, History and a Drink. So um, start looking on there. I'm going to post this stuff to there as well, the best I can. And uh, we're going to have fun with this. Now, with Flagler, do we have a drink in mind yet? So that's the most important part. That is one of the things. I've been trying to get in contact with the Flagler Hotel and talk to someone in the bar who has a little bit of knowledge of the history. Yeah. And the couple times that I've called, they're like, what? <laughs> So we just haven't got the right person quite yet. Exactly. So, so I think I've got to talk to management and see. Um, yeah. So that's been one of the things that we're trying to look at is I'm trying to look at something 1930s from their hotel or what would be even better is the bar menu from a the club car on one of the trains. On one of the they, trains. So um, I'm still doing my research and, and I've put my son on that as well to see what we yeah. can find. Um, but that's what we're looking for. So realistically, it's going to be something probably out of the 1920s, 30s, um, prohibition drink maybe yep. a little bit, and uh, go from there. Now, what we are going to try to do as well is, once again, we kind of were a little behind the times this week. But I think also, too, we're going to make sure and give you, we're going to go back to our original plan of giving you our um, to go to the store and buy list for whatever yeah. alcohol is required for the drink. We'll do that on Sunday so that you guys have time to be able to go to the liquor store, buy the drinks, so you can actually make it with us as we're doing this live. Yeah, exactly. So if you can't join us in the audience, you can at least join us remotely. Exactly. And uh, by Tuesday of uh, a couple weeks from now, when your kids are back in school, yeah. in whatever form that is, you're going to need a drink. Yeah, I know so that I'm going to need a drink. Yeah. So, uh, so we'll make them stronger as the season progresses. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So we hope you enjoy And we will see you next week uh, on Tuesday at 8 p.m. for History and the Drink Part 2. Hello. Good job to the guys in the audience. Thank you, guys. Woo! Yay!